The Northeast Energy Direct project, proposed by Kinder Morgan's Tennessee Gas Pipeline Company, is a proposed high-pressure gas pipeline to run from Troy, Pennsylvania to Wright, New York to Drake, Massachusetts. Transmission lines are like the superhighways of gas transportation, connecting the avenues and streets of pipeline at drilling and distribution sites at either end. This pipeline follows existing pipeline routes until Richmond, Massachusetts, where it's proposed to break off into Greenfield's locations, running through over 1,600 private, town, and conservation land properties along the way. There are lots of reasons why over 12,000 people so far have signed the petition to ban it. The pipeline will be buried, but most likely not deep enough. Federal law only requires pipelines to be buried three feet deep. Here in the Northeast, that leaves it susceptible to frost, ice, and other wet soil conditions that have led to explosions in other locations. The 100-foot wide clear cut required to install it would only ever grow halfway back, leaving a 50-foot cut through woodlands, farmlands, wetlands, and conservation lands. The company's plan for river crossings is to drill deep under the river beds. Even on well-constructed, well-maintained pipelines, intentional blowdown venting leaks raw, unrefined fracked gas into the atmosphere to vent pressure from the something. line. This but happens as part of normal operations uh, at compressor stations camera. every 40 to uh, 60 miles just... and at pipe maintenance pigging facilities every 10 to 30 miles. Aside from intentional blowdown points, pipelines are known to leak at every stage of transport, from wellheads and cracks in the fracking fields, through gathering line operations, transmission lines, and distribution lines to customers on the other end. All told, Studies of these leaks show that approximately 8 to 20 percent of all natural gas leaks into the atmosphere. While old-style pipelines maintained a pressure of about 200 pounds per square inch, this new transmission line is slated to run at 1,460 psi to allow more gas to be packed in for storage. This makes pipelines vulnerable to leaks, ruptures, and explosions. DOT figures show that significant incidents occur along gas transmission lines in America at a rate of just over one a week. This high compression also causes more condensation in the pipes, which, when leaks happen, makes more contaminated moisture to leak into the ground and waterways it crosses. Most gas is now extracted by hydraulic fracturing, known as fracking. This method involves drilling a mile or more down and a mile or more sideways, then pumping millions of gallons of water, mud, and a mixture of over 750 chemicals at high pressure to fracture the bedrock, releasing gas and oil from tiny pockets in the stone. Air quality tests near compressor stations and a recent study by the National Institutes of Health show that significant traces of these chemicals remain in the gas all the way through the transmission stations. Tests show at least 60 known carcinogens, neurotoxins, and endocrine disruptors in the gas. Natural gas is CH4. Methane is a greenhouse gas over 80 times more powerful than CO2 in the short term and 20 times worse in the long term. Though CO2 emissions from burning natural gas are significantly less than burning coal or oil, it still produces the greenhouse gas when burned to generate electricity. Because of our bold increases in solar and wind power in Massachusetts, the average of all sources of electric generation in Massachusetts generates only 910 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. The average natural gas electric plant puts out 1,210 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. This means adding more natural gas to our energy picture would move us away from our state-mandated greenhouse gas emission goals. Even during the polar vortex of 2013 to 2014, there was enough gas for heating and cooking and electric generation needs. The usual amount of extra energy capacity the regulators prefer to have on hand, enough to sell extra to New York State and some megawatts left over. The only problem was price spikes during the bottleneck created when heating and electricity generation compete. This happens approximately one week a year. ISO New England and NESCO only called for 0.6 billion cubic feet per day. This pipeline is proposed to be 2.2 billion cubic feet per day. With about four times more capacity than the stated need, where are the other three-fourths likely to go? This pipeline will end at a gas hub in Dracut, where it meets the Maritimes and Northeast pipeline. Maritimes and Northeast used to bring gas from Nova Scotia down to Massachusetts. It has now applied to reverse direction, bringing gas from Dracut to Nova Scotia, 
where two former import terminals have just converted to export. With Europe paying two to three times more for gas and Asia paying three to five times more, market forces would drive prices up for all gas, including that intended for domestic use as well, recreating the price spike problem this pipeline is supposed to be solving. Nesco's study, conducted by Black & Veatch, shows that with current energy efficiency programs continuing, there is no need for extra energy infrastructure, even with economic growth factored in. Asking all municipal buildings and schools to have solar installations where technically feasible could provide not just a boost to our clean energy balance, but help provide a more stable grid and fewer outages in times of natural disaster. Changes to building code could require big box stores and warehouses to allow utilities to put up solar panels to feed the grid, and then require the utility companies to do so. Fixing leaks in existing pipelines could save 400 megawatts of generation power currently being lost to the atmosphere. A recently passed Massachusetts law will be sealing up Class 1 and Class 2 leaks, which are safety hazards that are likely to explode, but it does nothing to seal up Class 3 leaks, which still waste the gas we already have. With an estimated cost of $3.75 billion, the pipeline is said by company officials to provide 3,000 jobs during peak construction. These are temporary jobs, lasting about 18 months, and many are likely to require specialists from other regions. Expanding efficiency in clean energy programs could provide up to eight times as many jobs that are local and permanent. We've already crossed the bridge to a clean energy economy. It's now time to step off the other side of it.